Now, I can't think of that without thinking of Dora the Explorer. Koki, Koki. <laughs> that was so like the probably best, the best way. That's definitely the best way for us to start the, uh, <laughs> the contents today. Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, welcome everybody to e-conference number 23. It is the last, second to last one uh, before we hit our grand finale on July 31st, or at least the grand finale for the summer and you know subsequent weeks or months. Um, so it's been a really fun run along the way. Um, we're we're going to talk a little bit about what we're uh, planning for the grand finale. It's everything and bigger and better. It's going to be amazing. Um, but because it is 2 p.m. here on the East Coast and in the evening on a Friday for Anna, um, she is actually going to be our first segment today. We're just going to get German words out of the way so that you get what you want and she gets a little bit of time to herself. So that, that'll be that'll be good. But uh, we've got uh, two recurring segments today. Um, Anna's Long German Words, Record Shop with Mike Smale, Podcast with Mary Holt. Um, Astronomy Apps today is gonna be hosted by Adam Fans, who's stepping in for Jeff Holt, so we don't get a Holt to Holt, but we get a, a, a fans over, if you will. Um, I've been working on that one for about three seconds. So that's, that's about the level you're gonna get today. Um, and then, of course, because it is a Friday, it is best parts of the week. Um, so if you've got a best part, bring it. Uh, and of course, our two big sessions today, um, the first from Emily Peavy from Imaloa, all the way in Hawaii, um, really exciting stuff. And then a second part of our true rally with Julieta, um, who I believe, uh, Julieta, are you sitting outside currently? Are you outside? Outside? Right, uh, and I have the deep space. The ultra as, field as, behind as me. Deeply out there as she can be. So um, we'll we'll have uh, we have a lot in store today. So let's get started. Let's get this thing working. Um, it's your favorite recurring segment in mine, all the way from Berlin, Germany. It's Anna Green's Long German Words of the Week. So um, this week, uh, I have some words that I kind of can't believe that I haven't used them yet or I didn't even think to use them yet. Um, and I will tell you, these are, this week, these are words that I actually do use. So there's always, you know, in previous weeks, there's always these really long, ridiculous words about laws and stuff that like, I'm never gonna use those, I'm not a lawyer. There's no reason for me to use those unless I'm trying to get Germans to say them for me. So some practical words this week. <laughs> All right, um, so could we have the first word, please, Michael? All right, der Zeiter Fassungsbogen. Der Zeiter Fassungsbogen. Is that a timesheet or earned income? I believe it's the opening lyric to an Offspring song. <laughs> I know exactly which one too. <laughs> Ooh, wow. So almost everyone's voted in. Right now, it looks like timesheet, 75%. Earned income, 23%. Anna, what is the correct answer? So Zeit is time, and uh, Bogen is sheet. <clears throat> so yeah, that is a timesheet. Excellent, excellent. What's the whole rest of it in the middle then? You know... They like filling, kind of like an Oreo. It's the cream filling of the long German word. Maybe it's a German hyphen. Like a German hyphen is no, a no, we, we have those too. We like to hyphenate, we. The German language likes to have a long word and then often hyphenate it with another long word. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't count those, we don't count those as one word for long German words of the week, right? Well, we did that one week. It was worth it. All right, yeah. word number two, here we go. Der Bezirk Schornstein Fegermeister. Der Bezirk Schornstein Fegermeister. Is that the official that one sees when they register where they live at the citizen's office? Or is that the head chimney sweep of the governing district? 
So this one was very interesting for me because the fact that there would be a head chimney sweep of any governing district in the year 2020, chimchuru, chimchuru. chimchuru. And I want to know why Anna uses that word a lot. <laughs> well, okay. So in, in all does. fairness, I actually only use about half this word. Just the dirtiest chimneys in all of Berlin. Or the citizen's office. Oh, oh true, true. So yeah, it looks like about two thirds of our respondents said, we have finally, we hit 100%. Everybody, thank you for participating. 65% um, uh, the official who you see when you register to live or where you live. And everybody else says the chimney sweep. Uh, Anna, what is the correct answer? It is the head chimney sweep of the governing district. <laughs> um, so Schornsteinfeger, um, like I got a notice on my apartment last week that the Schornsteinfeger was going to come and change our filters. So it's not like they don't just work on chimneys because I definitely don't have a fireplace. Um, but like they will come and look at like the, the, the like gas heater stuff and they'll like come change out filters and, and stuff, which really come last year. So I was kind of surprised when I got the notice on my door this year. Um, but yeah, so in Bezirk is um, like, the di that's how you say district, um, unless you're in Berlin and then it's Keats. That's the most shocking answer we've had in like 11 weeks. That's amazing. Um, but you do, when you move to a new place, um, you do have to go to the Bürgeramt, the citizen's office and register where you live. Um, but there you would just see like a Beamt or somebody who works in the office. Gotcha, gotcha. Great, all right. And then finally, word number three. Let's go. Die Arbeitsunfähigkeitsbescheinigung. Die Arbeitsunfähigkeitsbescheinigung. It's all fake. Like, you make this up. <laughs> this rolls right off the tongue. It's amazing. I, I, I won't lie. The first time I saw this word, I just, I went, why, what have I got myself into? My phone recognizes it now, though. <laughs> like, it'll autofill it. I mean, I'm on the call. Yay, that's good. <laughs> so, yeah, is that a worker's right to fair and equal treatment, or is it a certificate of incapacity to work? That's fair. All right, with 100% of the votes in, 68% say a worker. Oh, <laughs> A worker's right to fair and equal treatment. It's Friday. Uh, and 32% of certificate of incapacity to work. Anna, what is the correct answer? So um, last year was my first full year here. And often when you new, move to a new place, especially across an ocean, uh, your immune system takes a little while to catch up. <clears throat> and I was sick probably about every six weeks last year. Um, and so I often had to go to the doctor and get an Arbeitsunfähigkeitsbescheinigung and bring it into HR when I came back to work a week or two weeks later after being written out sick. So um, this is the official title for it. It is used, um, but you can also just say I was krankgeschrieben, so I was written sick, um, which is a lot easier to spell. <laughs> All right, so as we do every week, uh, anyone, anyone not named John Elbert, get all of them right. To any offers, any offers. Oh, okay, all right. So some twos, one three, and Marco side. It's like, uh, all right. So that means um, that means there are no more long Germans German words of the week between us and the longest German word of all of the weeks, uh, three weeks from now, July 31st, everybody get ready, it's gonna be amazing. So um, Anna, if you have any special requests for the, the finale, let us know and we'll do our best to uh, to make it truly a spectacle for-, uh, uh, for I, didn't get, I didn't get any fireworks here, so if you could just like shoot off some fireworks for me, that would be- <laughs> Every everybody gets a firework backdrop during. during 
Uh, well, thank you all again for playing. So once again, everybody, Anna Green's Long German Words of the Week. Awesome. All right. So moving on, our uh, our first um, presentation today comes to us all the way across, well, across half of the Pacific Ocean. Um, Emily, yes, Emily's in the room. So uh, the title, I will let Emily say because no one needs a, a New Yorker's tongue to destroy the beauty of the indigenous language. Uh, but Emily, of course, is from the Imaloa Astronomy Center uh, on the Big Island of Hawaii, and uh, is we're, I'm excited for this one. I, I, I've been anticipating this since she um, she had messaged me like, I really want to get this person. I'm like, oh, okay, great, perfect. So without further ado, everyone, Emily Peavy. Hey guys, so like my computer like mega crashed. <laughs> I was gonna show you guys a bunch of resources. So um, I'm gonna be bringing my computer back up um, while I'm talking a little bit and then I might jump on the call again on my computer so I'd be sharing resources with you. But until that, um, I'll just kind of talk story a little bit. And I kind of wanted to do this less as a formal presentation and more as an informal kind of talk story about this project, partially because um, I am involved in this project tiny bit. <laughs> I, I mostly kind of get the data for this and I put it in the planetarium. So I'm not the person organizing it, but it is an amazing project and it really is everything that um, Emiloa does. And the project is called Ohuahe Inoa. And um, Michael, one of the things that I, I wanted to bring up uh, talking about this is um, in, in discussing this project. And one of the reasons why I wanted to bring it up with the planetarium community is is that uh, I want people to be able to feel comfortable uh, saying these words and um, feel comfortable uh, approaching this. Since um, what Ahuahe Inua is, is it's the endeavor for discoveries uh, that are made in Hawaii to be given Hawaiian names by Hawaii language practitioners. And that's a wonderful, wonderful endeavor, but it only works if people use the names. <laughs> so. One thing I will say, um, and full disclosure, I am not fluent in Hawaiian. Um, I just practice the words that I can say over and over and over again. And then uh, eventually I know the words, but my fluency ends at proper nouns. I can say the proper nouns that are related to my job, but that's it. And so one of the reasons why I wanted to also do this is like we can also practice saying these words so you guys can become more comfortable and I would say uh, from my opinion as a person who's not fluent in Hawaiian I'll say that is I would prefer that you guys try to say these words and try to use them and make them uh, more known outside of Hawaii and if you slightly mispronounce it if just if you get corrected then correct it but don't be afraid to try to use the words because it takes away the whole point if people aren't even trying to use these terms that we're trying to put out there. Um, anyway, one second. I'm gonna mess with my computer a little bit just to see if I can get back on with you guys. So, um, as I mentioned, Ohuahe Inua is the endeavor to have Hawaii-based discoveries be given Hawaiian names. It's quite possible that you guys heard of a few of these that are considered a part of this project. Oumuamua came out a while ago. That was the interstellar asteroid that was discovered on Haleakala here in Hawaii and was named by Larry Kimura, who is the uncle of my boss, uh, Kayu Kimura. And Kayu is the person who's kind of uh, really put this program together uh, through Emiloa Astronomy Center, working with Larry Kimura, who is a Hawaiian language expert, as well as Doug Simons, the director of the, who's the director of the Canada France Hawaii Telescope here in Hawaii, to bring together a community in order to get um, research and proper uh, Hawaiian, how to say this, like uh, connection behind a name. Because there have been other names that are have been given to astronomical objects, but those names might not have had any consultation with indigenous people of, of that culture. One example is um, there's dwarf planets, uh, Haumea and Makemake. 
Haumea is named after the a creation deity here in Hawaii, and that asteroid was discovered in Hawaii, but when they gave the dwarf planet that name, there wasn't much consultation with P Hawaiian language experts. And Make Make, this one, it's like, you can see good intentions, but you can also see how those good intentions really went awry along the road. And um, so Maki Maki is a dwarf planet that is named after a creation deity from Rapa Nui, which is also known as Easter Island. Why it is called uh, Maki Maki is because the dwarf planet was discovered on Easter weekend. So astronomers go Easter weekend, Easter Island, Maki Maki, but then it's you're naming it off of this culture based off of how other people are perceiving that culture and not what the culture is perceiving in it itself. And one second. I'm gonna switch back to my computer. Isn't that the planetarian world? Isn't that the planetarian world where we're presenting and we're having to fix tech issues at the same time? Anyway, um, and if anybody has questions for me or any input that you want to say, just go ahead and speak up. Uh, now that I'm back here, I'm going to see if I can bring up some resources about Ohuehe Inua. And I'm going to share my screen and take you to our website, Inilo Astronomy Center, so that anyone who wants to be learning about this a little bit more and doing research or incorporating any of this information into your own presentations, you guys can be jumping in and doing it. And so uh, Oumuamua was the first object to be named officially through the Huehe Inua program and it was named independently with uh, Larry Kimura. And Larry also named another object, which is also considered to be a part of Ohuehe Inoa, and that is Povehi. Uh, you guys might know Povehi better as the black hole picture. Um, we, we here know it as, in Hawaii know it as Povehi, and we love Povehi, and Povehi is my adopted child, and I will love it, and I will, I will fight anybody who says anything against it. <laughs> but, um, so, Meaning behind these names, Oumuamua, the interstellar asteroid that passed through our solar system, Oumuamua essentially means like the first of its kind, a scout, an investigator kind of coming up and uh, checking things out. Uh, Povehi, Po is a concept that's in the Kumulipo, which is one of the last surviving Hawaiian cosmologies. And Po is kind of this thing that um, the the universe helps begin the universe. So Po is this like unending dark force and Vehi is an embellishment upon that dark force. So looking at the picture of the black hole, it's Po Vehi, an embellishment upon this dark creating force. And so those two were named independently with by Larry Kimura, a Hawaiian language expert. He kind of named those independently just because those were discoveries that we knew were gonna make a big splash and we didn't know a lot of information about them until just as they're coming out. So he needed to have a name right as, at his fingertips and name it very quickly. And, but other ones is, other uh, Ohuaheanua objects are named a little bit more slowly where we uh, contact astronomers here in Hawaii, think about what kind of uh, discoveries are coming out and what kind of discoveries might become very interesting in the scientific world as we go along. And uh, we learn ev what, everything we know about those discoveries and then we gather Hawaiian immersion students or Hawaiian immersion teachers to come to Imiloa talk with astronomers directly, be able to interact directly with this research and learn everything that they can know about these objects. And then they work together as a whole workshop of all these people who are immersed in the culture and the language in order to come up with a name for that unique object. And so as of today, we have four that were named through that process. And if you go onto our website under Ahuahe Inua, oh, Ahuahe Inua, by the way, means to call forth a name. 
and naming is a very, very um, important, it's a very important process in Hawaiian culture. So I encourage you guys to play this video sometime that kind of talks about this project. This is the first cohort that we're naming the objects. Um, here's uh, my boss, uh, Kayu Kimura. Here's our navigator in residence, um, Kalepa Babayan. There's the director of CFHT, uh, Doug Simons. And all these guys are um, high school students who went through Hawaiian immersion school. So these are students who in their school, they um, only spoke, read, and wrote Hawaiian language in their school in, up until around the third grade. So completely immersed in the Hawaiian language and part of the Hawaiian Renaissance to bring the language back to being a living language. And they worked on naming um, two asteroids and I'm gonna scroll down past a bunch of stuff. There you go. Uh, these are the two asteroids that they named, uh, Komo'o Aleva. So um, I'm gonna pronounce it a bit slow. I always pronounce these fast just cause I've gotten used to pronouncing them, but Komo'o Aleva. In the Hawaiian language, if you're not used to seeing things in the Hawaiian language, the little apostrophe like thing is called an okina and that indicates a guttural stop. So you actually uh, stop a little bit in the word. So komo'o aleva. So uh, komo'o aleva is a quasi moon. It's an asteroid that's orbiting around the sun, but we're kind of pulling and tugging on this asteroid as it's orbiting around the sun. So we're affecting its orbit as it goes around and that causes the object to oscillate. So the name is reflecting on that, on its oscillation. And this name also um, calls back a little bit again to the Kumulipo. A uh, fun story. Uh, I was doing research on a bunch of these objects a couple months ago in order to make some online material for us. And I was just seeing what kind of research has popped up on these asteroids since we named them. And there is a paper that was published in the Astrophysical Journal that included Komo'o Aleva as a possible candidates for aliens to be sending spy satellites to spy on us. There's a, it was published in the Astrophysical Journal. And if you want that article, let me know, I'll link it to you. But it was, it, it was a bunch of asteroids, but Komo'o Aleva is possible place where aliens could have uh, lurkers of alien spy satellites looking at us. Um, the other asteroids named through this project is, this is, I know this name's a little, a little bit harder. It's okay, don't be intimidated. Oh, one rule about the Hawaiian language the Hawaiian language, in order to take a sentence or anything or a phrase and turn it into a proper noun, you take that sentence or phrase and you take out all the spaces and you smush it into one word. And then that makes it a proper noun. So uh, one example of this, you guys pr probably heard about the mountain Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea means white mountain. Mauna is mountain, Kea is white. If you spell it Mauna space Kea, that's a description. That's describing a white mountain. And that could describe any white mountain. That could be Pikes Peak, Fuji, any mountain that has snow on it can be Mauna space Kea. If you have it as one word Mauna Kea, then it's a proper noun and then it's our mountain, it's our Mauna Kea. So just rule of thumb for things like that. That also means like when you're looking at proper nouns in the Hawaiian language, trying to learn them. It looks like these really, really long words. But once you see how the word's broken up into the sentence or the phrase, it becomes a little bit easier to pronounce, which becomes an art. So there's stuff going on in the chat. I wanna make sure. Yeah, large Hawaiian words. I don't feel comfortable enough hosting that. I could do some, but not a lot. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so ka epa o ka a vela. The other thing of uh, W's in the Hawaiian language, you pronounce them a little bit more like a V. So, ka, epa, so the Ethiopian got the guttural spot. O, ka, a, the ka, ko, the line over the A makes, means that you draw out the sound of that letter a little bit more. Vela. Ka, epa, o, ka, a, vela. Ka, epa, o, ka, a, vela. Ka, epa, o, ka, a, vela. I see you guys mouthing it and I like it. It's doing great. Um, Ka'epa o Ka'avela is a um, retrograde asteroid orbiting in the region of Jupiter. And his retrograde makes us think that he 
um, did not form in the solar system, that he likely formed from a sister star to our sun. And then in the early days of the solar system, we grabbed him and now he's stuck orbiting around the sun in the backwards direction in a retrograde motion. Uh, and so his name uh, roughly translates to the quid, to um, a mischievous or uh, unruly person who's going backwards. And Cavella just means Jupiter. That's the name of Jupiter. So it's the mischievous backwards companion of Jupiter. So these two are on our website because these two were named a few years ago, uh, back in 2017. And one of the reasons why I definitely wanted to talk about this today is because a couple of weeks ago, we had a couple of really cool big announcements from the last cohort that we did. Now, um, for fun, interesting perspective, I'm gonna stop sharing just so I can see your guys' faces. For a fun, interesting perspective, uh, the last cohort that we had, so the last time we had um, like uh, all these astronomers from the different observatories who are experts on these objects uh, came into the planetarium, talk about these objects. And uh, the second cohort, we had a Hawaiian immersion teachers, so people who are teaching um, in the Hawaiian language with Hawaiian immersion schools. Uh, we had them here, had all this fantastic discussion. They're in a room and they're talking about all these names and talking about how astronomy relates to Hawaiian culture. And that was occurring two days after the TMT protest, protest started, which was wild because it's like it's all this craziness and conflict in our community and then I come to work and here's all these people that are supposed to be in such conflict like all working together in order to like create something and move something forward which was really, really beautiful so uh, we so these objects were named last year um, but we did not announce those names until a couple weeks ago um, one of the names was we wanted to make sure that it was named before a paper was published about it. So the people who did research on this object um, were prepping a paper for publication and they wanted the Hawaiian name to be included in that paper. So it would have the Hawaiian name from the beginning, which is great because like a like with Povehi, we didn't know about Povehi. We only knew like illusions about what was happening with Povehi, but it was so embargoed. And then the embargo was released but because Hawaii, because of our time difference, half the world knew about the discovery before we even had a chance to jump on and give it a name before we could come in with, with the name that we had suggested for it. I say we, I was barely involved. Um, Larry Kimura. So let me, so the other big discovery, which I actually scrolled past really quickly is the one that came out just a couple weeks ago is a quasar. And when we were first talking about this, it was the farthest quasar in the universe. By the time the paper got published, it is one of two of the farthest quasars in the universe, which is, <laughs> this one should be the farthest. Uh, this is, this was also on our website, and this, I'm still working on this name. I'm still practicing this name a little bit. It always helps me when I read it because then I can see how the wor words are. Ho, so that's a call back once again to the Kumulipo, that unending dark energy that creates the universe. New, this always makes me up because I'm used to seeing N-U-I, which is Nui, like Mahali nu Mahalo Nui Loa, which means thank you very much, but this is new. And I use news like the word new. Ah, Anna. Ponu a Anna. Sorry, wow, look at that. Ponu a Anna. Ponu a Anna. I'm still practicing. Ponu a Anna. And so, very, very fascinating quasar discovered. Um, I'm going to say this, but don't quote me. Redshift 6.35. And if I scroll down, it might correct me. Something like that. I, I will link. I will link you an article <laughs> if you're interested. Uh, but one of the most distant quasars that we've ever uh, observed, and uh, so Ponu Aena 
Larry Kimura, I really think he wants to name all black holes Poe, which awesome. I'm down for that. We need a no we need a naming system for black holes and I, I vote for Poe. Uh, new it's oh how to describe it. It's like embellishment. It's like um swirling embellishment around it. And if I had read this a little bit more, I'd have a better way to describe exactly what this word means. But I'll link all these articles so you guys can read it as well. Ponu uh, Ena. And then the other discovery that came out, which I brought up articles for and then my computer crashed, was uh, Lele Aku Honua. And let me see how well my computer remembers what I was typing before. That's not what I wanted. I thought Google was supposed to be good at, at reading your mind. <laughs> I was on the Wikipedia for it earlier. There you are. Okay. I'm gonna take you guys to the Wikipedia, but there's better sources that describe it. <laughs> but uh, Lelia Kuhonua is the farthest uh, dwarf planet that we've ever discovered so far. This is his orbit on his Wikipedia. It, it's huge. <laughs> it's it goes really, really far. So uh, Lelia Kuhonua, once again, is, is a name that alludes back to the Kumulipo and um, it compares the object and the orbit to the flight of a migratory bird that is always yearning to be come back to the earth. So uh, I know Honua means earth. So Lele Aku Honua. So take it back. Lele Aku Honua. Um, this one, I think we were allowed to talk about it before last week, but we just kind of combined the black hole one or the quasar one with this one because they got named at the same time. So now we have press releases going out about these two objects. So uh, counting the objects that Larry Kumura named, we have six objects named through the Ahuahe Inua program. Knock on wood with COVID, like you never know these days. It's This is a project, this is an endeavor that we can continue to be bringing and it's it goes so far beyond like oh here's an object a person looking at it going oh I think it's going to be this name it's people come in they learn everything that we know about this object everything we know about the science behind why we'd be interested in this object and then these people who are so immersed in the, in the language and the culture like sit in a room in a workshop for like two days and thinking about like okay what is the best way that we can be describing this object and be giving it a name forever but um. Yep, so that's kind of my my talk story about it sort of thing. Like I said, I'm I'm involved with this in that they give me data for these objects and I put them in the planetarium and then people come in and talk about it. So I'm not the most involved, but it is a project that I really, really believe in. And I just love that we're doing it here. But uh, I love any questions or comments, concerns, um, what resources you want to make sure that I share with you guys. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Feel free if anybody's got questions for Emily. Uh, go ahead and share them. Um, we've got a, a small enough crowd too, where if you'd just like to um, uh, unmute and, and ask, we can do that as well. That won't be a problem. Okay, great. Well, Emily, we also think um, we, you should at some point, maybe in the like the second iteration of the e-conferences, uh, do long Hawaiian words of the week. So. <laughs> That might be. I'll have to wait a little bit. Might be we're, about, well. um, we're about to but, start a summer enrichment program that's going to take over my life for the rest of July. So I might not see you guys again until August. Well, that's okay. We, if, maybe if we see you on the 31st, like we get you okay. for the for a few minutes, that'd be good. Um, so thank you, Emily. That was fantastic. Uh, and then our, our uh, second uh, big session today uh, is the second part of uh, her virtual reality talk. Um, Juliana Aguilera. Uh, uh, Based out of Chicago right now, um, I'll just turn it over to you. This is uh, this is the expansion of, of virtual reality. So if you liked it the first time, you're gonna love it the second time. So go ahead.
Okay. Oh, thank you. So uh, this is gonna be complementary to what I uh, talked about last week. Um, especially someone asked about translating the senses to me last week, Faith was you. Uh, and I thought, well, that's exactly what I was gonna talk about, uh, what I wanted to talk about to you. Uh, so we did um, cover these issues here, agency, immersion, proximity, and presence uh, coming from devices. So uh, this week I wanted to talk about our body devices, you know, our sensors, uh, sensors are an our uh, motor system. So that's why I name it like this. Um, so we have the understanding of how we move in a space that give us agency, uh, understanding how that motion over time uh, makes us feel immersed, even when we have a 360 uh, image and we're, we have to look around. So we look around at a certain speed. Uh, so we need time to look around. Uh, there's a, a spatial, how we evaluate the space that tells us how far we are from objects, proximity. So we're kind of we're gonna revisit the, the idea of a stereoscopy. Uh, and then this uh, self-referential aspect of having an avatar that gives us his presence. Um, that because, you know, I have this memory of having people try the Oculus at SVL um, when I was there at Adler. And the first thing they noticed would be, where are my feet? You know, <laughs> what, what's missing? So let me see. There's this nice quote from Alda Noe. He's a kind of philosophy writer. Um, and it does present us this idea of how we really live in virtual reality all the time because we build these models to ourselves in our minds that help us navigate the world and understand things and so forth. Uh, two other people that kind of go in the same uh, venue of ideas are. Uh, that I would mention would be Francisco Varela, who in the 70s wrote a very uh, seminal book on the biological basis of cognition. Uh, and then uh, Lisa Barrett Thelman, who wrote a book uh, three, three years ago about um, how we not only uh, have this cognition, but we rewire, we custom rewire our own brains on experiencing things. So this idea that had been floating around for years saying there's a section of your brain that has to do with this sense or with this motor system. It's like, well, actually no. <laughs> As we live in the world, we wire our own brains to an extent. And she has a very nice uh, uh, talk and a podcast called Circle of Willies uh, about brain stuff. Um, and also presents it in this familia. So Lisa Barrett Thelman, very, very recommended to kind of understand this embodiment, building models, understanding reality. So uh, why I bring this up uh, is because uh, we do have this system, right? And I always show, <laughs> this may be like the fifth time that I show it to planetarians, you know, these two, these two uh, figurines that are in the museum in, in London the Science Museum, and one shows uh, how much of the brain, it's representing how much of the brain uh, is devoted to uh, the sense of sight, the sense of taste, uh, the, sen the sense of touch. Uh, so of course the mouth is really big because we don't wanna poison ourselves, so taste is very important. And the hands are super huge because we need to do lots of things with them, right? And then uh, the motor system, uh, showing, uh, you know, how, how much we can do with the hands. Again, a lot of brain devoted to this, to this sense. Uh, but how do we interpret these things? It, it's a different story, right? Um, so 
in thinking about VR over the years, you know, I, I did this many, many years ago, uh, how our senses are not created equal, but we have uh, the, the things that we can taste need to be inside our mouth pretty much. The things we can, can smell need to be like in the surrounding area. The things we can touch, you know, there's so, so much you can, your, your arm can reach. Um, the things we can hear, and then uh, the only thing that escapes our Earth's atmosphere is vision, right? We can see stars, but we cannot taste them and we cannot touch them, right? Uh, with our motor sensor, sensor system. So we do have a very custom device in our body. And that device tells us a lot of how we experience reality and how we make models of that reality. Uh, so that's uh, pretty important. Now, a very super important sense in VR is proprioception. So I, it's not in the other diagram, but it is super, super, super important. Uh, and last uh, talk, when I show you that uh, drawing of Durer show, uh, showing perspective and how VR was reinterpreting this perspective because you are that moving point in a space. Well, proprioception is not only that, it does, it's, it's not only uh, where you're in a space, but how you relate to that space. You know, where's the position of your arm? How far do you have to move to reach things uh, or to touch things? How much do you have to walk to get to them? So you have a model of how the surrounding space is approachable to your body. Uh, and that sense, the proprioception that gives you that evaluative power of how you exist in space is super, super important in virtual reality. And uh, the, the things that it uh, can help enlighten and help reflect uh, in astronomy, of course, is super important because we're trying to relate to outer space and distant galaxies and so forth, right? Um, so it has this component that is super relevant to what we do in planetariums because we are extending that sense of proprioception to the our extended body that becomes the planet or the galaxy where we are in a space depending on the visualizations that we have people experience so uh, you may remember if you went to uh, our joint lipa and all the conferences in st louis at the science center they had the uh, one of the Blue Angel uh, airplanes there, right? Uh, and of course, if you are aware of the, of the Blue Angels that they go up and do all these acrobatics in, in the air, uh, but you know about the, the history and how uh, their understanding of space is so interesting in the sense that during World War II, um, I don't remember this, uh, but the, the pilots that shot down most of the other opponent of their opponent airplanes were just a handful. Uh, and they were so good at it, at pointing and taking down uh, that some people theorized that they could see the future <laughs> because they, they would guess so well, they were so sharp in knowing where the other, uh, the, the other plane was gonna go. Uh, so there's this idea of situational awareness and there's like some of it is this sense of proprioception of the body of the pilot being embodying this airplane and knowing how the other airplanes uh, move and how they're gonna turn. That is quite, quite interesting. Uh, if you think of them as this other construct you know, of the, the people piloting this, having that model of a space that expands their body to the airplane and understand what flying is, you know, embodying. Because we do have a, some sense of proprioception when we drive, we embody the car, right? We know how much we need to move to park and not crash on the other cars and so forth. So there are these extensions and we can be very good at building these models that and I enable us to take over these objects and expand our body into them. So uh, 
I wanted to uh, talk about up speed and moving this body through space. Uh, and this idea of like the speed that becomes too fast. I don't know if you remember like learning to ride a bicycle when you were little and then having to take on the, the speed of the bicycle that accelerates your body to, to a speed that you're not used to, right? This is a time lapse I took on the underground in the subway in the L, the Chicago subway. Uh, and I, I show this a little bit because I was like the queen of car sickness when I was little, you know, I just was so bad at being in a car and not throwing up. Um, but then I started working in VR and so at some point, at some point I did learn how to distance myself to, to that perception of time enough that I could read on buses uh, that had very bad drivers and then I could be in virtual reality experiences and have no problem flying um, and navigate these things with it, understanding and distancing the sense, my sense of proper perception from the experience that, that I had in there. Now, um, this is like human scale, right? I want to show you another thing. Now, this is speed here is we were moving my mother-in-law um, from, from her house to my brother-in-law's house from Michigan to Missouri. And of course it's a long drive. So I was doing some time lapses. And if you look at the, at the clouds, the speed really shrinks the clouds to an extent. You know, if, if, I, be, if I could block the lower part of this, of this movie, uh, you would feel like you're moving through fog, right? It would feel like a, like a different scale altogether. Uh, or you could say, you know, here's a monster walking through the clouds, you know, and then uh, it's, it's showing the size of that monster. Um, so, so there are things that change when you change the scale, the speed and so forth. And you try to accommodate the human senses to not people cursing, right? Uh, in this new experience. So it is, uh, uh, um, it takes like learning, a, riding a bike, if you wish, or driving a car. Um, let's see what, and oh, I forgot the, this one. Uh, and then you have this, the stereoscope, the idea of a stereoscopy, right? That things on the other hand, when they are put in 3D uh, in, in a stereo vision, uh, the implication of that for your body in terms of a scale is that you are one or two steps away from what you're seeing. Therefore, you are the size, if you, if you have planet Earth in front of you, you are the size of planet Earth. And if you have the Sombrero Galaxy here, you are the size of the Sombrero Galaxy. So, so there are implications on how we uh, build these virtual worlds and how we scale the human experience in terms not only of space, but time. Uh, that need a little bit of a of a learning uh, to uh, a, a learning curve to understand that level of visualization. Um, let's see. And of course, I, oh, I should have shown this before. So, I grew up watching movies about monsters, right? Uh, well, why would you know that? But here it is a time lapse of ocean, and, and this, uh, the way the monsters operated in this series that I watched with my brother and my young uncle was that you would see the monster next to this slow motion water, right? Which made the monster feel very big. Um, and it gave you a reference, right? You felt like the monster, 
you know, because that's what you're seeing. It's like your avatar in the space. Uh, so there is uh, some, some, something to say about what we do in planetariums where we don't have an avatar, uh, but we are expected to kind of create a persona to inhabit the different speeds and scales that we are presenting. You know, so uh, of course, if this was in a HDMI uh, head mounted display and you can see the feet of the monster, you would say, oh, I'm a monster now. And that would give you a reference. So uh, sometimes it's not a, an avatar that we present, but we do present uh, a planet, an asteroid, or uh, an object that is familiar to us that allows us to measure where we would be with our actual bodies in this virtual space. So it gives us a, sen a sensory motor vocabulary with which to address the situation. Now, this is this um, this idea of uh, translating the senses. I think it's it's very important to understand to cust to customize uh, to tailor these these experiences of outer space that we are presenting to the public. Not that we need to play everything at the slowest speed possible so people will not throw up, but having an understanding of how the speed should be introduced and primed to represent something about what we're visualizing. Um, and I had, you know, practical things. This is not new. We do things all the time. Here's a bottle of wine. And if you drink, you know, these things, uh, you will look at the description. And the description in this case has a, a quote by Moby Dick that says, for there is no folly of the beast of the earth, which is not infinitely outdone by the madness of men. And you're like, what? But then it says, creating quality Pinot Noir as an affordable price, in an affordable price is a winemaking obsession, the ultimate white whale. So it, it brings you the experience of the effort of making this wine and it gives a, a sense, like a sensory motor experience of confronting this well when you drink this wine. Or this other one is gonna tell you, tell you um, it has a citrus character expressing attractive notes of peaches and green apples. Because if you try these wines just out of the blue, what are you gonna think of it? You know, it's not something that you have experienced before. So in understanding how uh, creating these virtual worlds have to uh, fish out previous experiences of people. Uh, it, it does introduce that idea of having to help people create these models in their brain to have a immersive experience themselves. Now, this past week I've been painting the room where I'm in and this is Big Chill was one of the colors. Uh, the other one is more interesting. I picked this color and it's called Blue Peacock. And it did bring back some references to me because I remember I had this memory of three year, being a three year old and seeing a peacock from the first time and becoming obsessed and drawing it many, many times. So it does bring, it does make the, fam, the non-familiar familiar. So how do we go from uh, taking sensor data uh, that may be from distant galaxies that we cannot really see with our eyes, but through a telescope, we can retrieve them, right? Or bringing all these uh, waves that we cannot see and move them to the little bit that we can see. How does that come together? How does the gravitational data coming from LIGO telling us that there's waves just, you know, going through us right now uh, that we cannot really see. How does that translate on our experience of the world? So there, I think there are the very valuable things to reflect upon and uh, how the, what we are experiencing and being primed by these vir virtual reality experiences uh, to understand something about the universe and how we are converting all this experiential data that we have from our natural experience into these other ones. Um, so I think 
that's about what I wanted to say. But if you have any questions, I do have lots of books about space and philosophy of space. If you ever want to read about these things, you know, please, by all means, uh, let me know. Uh, and if you have any questions, let me know too. Yeah, uh, any questions for Leanne before we move on? Oh, I also had a little Godzilla. <laughs> Maybe I, you could post a reading list to some of those books. Sure. Yep. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. I'll see where I. Uh, I'll put them in the event page. Excellent. Awesome. So they don't get lost. <laughs> Thank you, Leanne. Much appreciated. Um, so now we're moving on to our um, our, our recurring segments of the week, and so. Uh, of course, astronomy apps, usually with Jeff Holt. Jeff wasn't able to join us this week, but he did uh, very studiously find a, a capable replacement. So um, today's astronomy apps for your at-home audience was special guest host, Adam Fans. Adam, take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, no, I am not Jeff Holt, but I do play him on TV. So... <laughs> Just to be old enough to understand that one. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna do a little bit with um, uh, some apps. And I, I am an Apple person, but I did try to find out if, um, if these apps would also work on an Android device. So what I'm gonna do, just because of bandwidth, I'm gonna turn my, vi my video off, but then share my iPad screen. Uh, so stopping that and I'm going to share there it is. Oops. share okay so there's my iPad desktop and I'm actually going to do three apps because I'm going to cover them very briefly uh, the first one related to my backdrop which is called time and I don't know if you can actually hear that or not, but um, the this program is called Emerald Time. It is free. It's from Emerald Sequoia. And it uses network time protocol servers to give you a very accurate time. Um, so what it's doing, it's actually looking at, if I click on that, it's actually looking at four servers and getting averaging them to get as accurate a time as possible. And you can change like that's universal time, uh, or that 24 hour version, Eastern daylight time, et cetera. And uh, there's also a nighttime clock. So you can have this for your observatory. It's free. Um, let's see, for the Android, uh, it's called the Atomic Clock and Watch Accuracy Tool <clears throat> with NTP time. And I'll post this information on the chat in a minute. But um, it, you can just hear it. It's great for setting clocks or you know, setting your telescope. So I'm going to kill that one. Uh, my second one is a variant on what Jeff did the other time about uh, gas giant planets. And um, so let me go here. This, this one is from Software BISC. And um, what's, it's similar because it shows how the plant, how the Jovian planets, is how it should be called, uh, will look in a telescope. But it's all four of the Jovian planets, along with their moons. And then down here, you can go forward or back in time. So you can really see how things look. If you go to the information page, you can set your date and time, and if you flip the image around, or what telescope and eyepiece you're using. And so, um, actually, so here's Saturn. And, but of course, also Uranus. Oops, that's not going to change you much. And Neptune. Um, so let me kill that one. Let me go on to number three, which we're almost <laughs> done. And that is totality. So as you can see, what it's going to do is default to the next one in our in my area, which is in the United States. But you can choose one of these other eclipses. 
And then, oops. Okay, so that was an example. So you can zoom in and it's, it's using Google Earth mapping. You can touch on it. There we go. So you see how I touched on it, it gives you information. So it's a great way to, if you're trying to find a good place for an eclipse, uh, you can do that or just planning on a trip as to where I wanna be. And if you click outside of it, it says 95.7% partial eclipse. So that kind of thing. Um, so just trying to keep it short. Let me stop the share and turn my video back on. There I am. And that is also, all of these are free. The last one is from Big Kids Science and um, is on, available through Apple or Android. And uh, that's the information for those three. Um, I use, of all these, I actually use Emerald Time the most when I use it to set my uh, the computer clock on, the, on my telescope uh, out in the field. And I know you could use your cell phone and those should be very accurate. I do not have a cell phone. So big shocker there, but I do have this. Okay, I have a visual aid. <laughs> You see that dial tone, uh, you know, rotary dial. And this is not our oldest phone. And yes, it does work. Anyway. And you found it in a dump. I did. The other one's from 1946. This one's from 60 something. And they work. Anyway, any questions or whatnot? All right, well, thank you, Adam. Okay. A, a fine fill in for Jeff this week. And yeah, you, you might not have a cell phone, but you've got a five inch astrophysics refractor. So, like, it, it balances out in the long term, I think. Yeah. And then, uh, so what would have been the whole to whole, as we said before, this is the fans over. Um, just making it into the room, probably digitally running around the internet. Um, it is. Pandemic Primo podcast party for your planetarium, ladies and gentlemen, all the way from San Francisco. It's Mary Holt. Oh, wait, is Mary Holt in the building? Sorry, I thought I was later. <laughs> no, I'm here. Next. All right. Uh, give me two seconds to grab my slides. Hi, everybody. I'm coming directly from our. Uh, uh, our live stream that we just did for the Academy with our fellow uh, planetarian Kachoon you today as well. So you should check it out after this if you want to see the recording. Okay, well, welcome to PPP, PFP, <laughs> uh, Pandemic Primo Podcast Party for Your Planetarian. And today's episode is just kind of random stuff. Uh, which I realized as I was prepping for this, I actually have not done kind of a random no theme one yet. So once I realized that, I felt less bad about not thinking of a theme today. Um, but I have a few different, um, <clears throat> I have a couple that I just recently learned about that I wanted to share, which one of which is Mesa Verde vo Voices, which I, uh, uh, wanted to listen to because I was going to Mesa Verde for the first time uh, last week or a week and a half ago. What is time? I don't know. Uh, but it is a really good podcast. Even if you don't go to the particular place, it's not like you have to like go to the national park or whatever to listen to it. It's mostly about um, like the history of native people in that area. And then the native people that live there, there right now and kind of how they think about that space and that land and, uh, the Mesa Verde, uh, uh, what would you call it? I don't know if you would even call them buildings, but, and just their interactions with the National Park Service and all sorts of interesting stuff. So highly recommend. And then another one that I recently listened to, uh, my boyfriend and I, as we drove across the country, binge listened to this entire podcast. It's 10 episodes, uh, about an hour long each. And it's just kind of an in-depth overview of the Iraq war, which 
I didn't know a lot about. So it was just kind of nice to have a bit more information about it. And it they're kind of funny with how they do it, but also like uh, get into a lot of details and stuff that I wasn't aware of before. And I have a few that I just have been surprised that I haven't even mentioned yet. Uh, Radio Lab is one of the, I think actually the very first podcast I ever listened to now probably like 13 years ago or something like that. And it's excellent. It's um, often a lot about science, but also uh, just stories from people and they play around with the audio and music and stuff like that. Uh, sometimes a little bit too much in my opinion. Jad's taste in music is very far away from mine. So anytime he tries to share stuff he likes, I'm like, Jad, no, the Let's not, <laughs> but <laughs> but if you like it, perhaps you'll be into his music taste. I don't know. Um, and another one, one of the original podcasts in my mind, this is kind of the one that got podcasts really starting to be more popular and uh, kind of extended it beyond the two dudes at a microphone chatting for two hours. Uh, this one was very much a succinct story. Um, it came out one episode each week and followed this a uh, uh, story of Adnan Zayed, who was a, well, oh, still, a, oh, I haven't looked, he might still be in prison, actually, I should probably follow up on that, but uh, about his story, um, and it's very, very good, and there's three seasons of it, I wasn't a huge fan of the following seasons, the first season was definitely the best one, but some people like the other ones, too, if you want to check those out, and this one is kind of a a meta podcast, if you will. This is a podcast about making podcasts and uh, about starting a podcasting company. So this is a story from the creator of Gimlet Media, which does a lot of the podcasts that I listen to. And they kind of segued away for a few seasons after they finished that uh, to talk about different startups. Um, there was a series they did about uh, starting new churches. There was one about uh, venture capitalism, like lots of different stuff. And if you want to get real serious and uh, and listen to a podcast that is like three hours long per episode, but has a lot of interesting information, uh, Hardcore History is a good one. I listened to the entire series that was about World War One, which in total was probably at least 10 hours. Um, and I approached it with the idea of just kind of listening to it as I was doing lots of different stuff, aware that I was not going to absorb all of the information, but I know a lot more about World War I now than I did before, which was before basically nothing. So there you go. And this is another random one that I really, really enjoyed. It's done, it's been done for several years, but it's just a couple of guys that are uh, producers for Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, I believe. And they just are really funny and just talk about random stuff and give advice and talk about the science behind a bunch of different things. And I'll have a couple at the end here that are podcasts I'm intending to listen to but have not yet. Um, this one was recommended to me by several people. Um, the first uh, season was all about multi-level marketing. And then the second season, as you can see here, is about the like wellness trend and the deal behind that. And basically it's about scams for the most part and oh i thought i had a second one no i guess that that's it so that's all i've got for today's ppp pfp and i'm still brainstorming what our final one will be on the last uh day but i'm i'm thinking something along the lines of the greatest podcast of all time so stay tuned for that uh for our last one on the 30th 31st 31st. 31st. Yeah. So thank you all again so much for listening to me talk about podcasts. And the greatest go. podcast of all time. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Well, we're going to get excited for that. Uh, and then our last recurring segment, um, he, he knows he's only got two left, but you know, you know, he's bringing the good stuff all the way from Chicago. It's the record shop with Mike Smale. Hey, everybody. Yeah, welcome to the uh, 12th and penultimate edition of The Record Shop. Got a good good variety for you today, and I'm just, I think I've just about got everything figured out for the 31st as well, but let's get started. Uh, first up on the dock for today, 
is a record by a gentleman named Jeff Tweedy. Uh, Jeff Tweedy is the frontman of a band called Wilco. That's how most people know him. Uh, he's also released some solo material on the side. And what I have for you here is his, uh, I believe still his newest solo release. It came out last year. It's called uh, Warm Warmer. It's, it's actually a double album. Uh, the first record was called Warm and then Warmer was sort of a, a, a follow-up uh, that was also released uh, in this kind of paired package. It's a little bit hard to tell from the, uh, from the picture, but this is a nice kind of a cloth bound uh, uh, booklet. Uh, and of course, uh, it's a gatefold, it folds open. You've probably already noticed the appeal. We've got the whole variety of sort of silver embossed uh, constellation outlines. There's Ophiuchus and the bears and Pegasus and all that good stuff. Uh, and then on the on the inside of the book, there's nice some nice kind of full page uh, artwork, some notes, some lyrics, things of that nature. Jeff's music is uh, it's very much solo guy with a guitar uh, sort of thing, uh, good storytelling, um, and a uh, a fun secondary little connection. So this um, you can buy you can still pretty much get warm the the single LP single album version. You can find that in record stores. You can find that out. Uh, this uh, this is out of print now. This is just the, the black vinyl version. Uh, there's also a really slick looking clear vinyl with blue and black uh, uh, splatter uh, print, which looks really cool, but it's a little bit more expensive on the secondary market. Um, but the uh, the connection here to, uh, to, to Tweety and to this record specifically. So uh, at the Adler, we got a call. Our uh, VP of marketing had some sort of connection to Jeff Tweety or his record label or something of that point. And so they called us and they said, hey, we, we're looking for somewhere to uh, shoot the cover art for this new Jeff Tweedy record. And we'd like to, like, a, we want to do this like a stars thing. So we'd like to come down to the planetarium. So uh, they, they came down to Adler and we, uh, we set them up in, our, in our, our big theater and took some pictures. And they were like, okay, like, let's, you know, see the constellation. So we put up, you know, both, both varieties, you know, your stick figures and your, your classical artwork. And of course, it was still a very, very dark room. And even with a little bit of light on him, the photos didn't come out all that well. And then there was there was some sort of tension that we tr <laughs> tried not to dig into too much, but it seemed that uh, Jeff had one very clear idea for what he wanted the art to look like. And then the sort of photographer art guy had a very, very different idea. Uh, he was asking for like nebulae and galaxies and like bright, colorful things, whereas Jeff was just looking for like the stars. Um, End result was that obviously the stuff they got wasn't usable, uh, but they still ended up doing this really nice kind of cloth bound uh, book version of the warm warmer double record. All right, so let me sorry, switch over to my notes here. And again, you can uh, listen to or, or download uh, the, the digital tracks from his band camp there and then Wilco World, again, that's his band Wilco, that's their uh, their website down below. Our second record for the day <clears throat> is by a Swedish band that I'm safely sure none of you have ever heard of before. It's called The Surfeats is the name of the band. The record is called Escapades in Space. And uh, maybe our, our first trivia question, does anybody recognize the satellite that's pictured uh, on the cover of this? It's a real satellite. Jada, oh no, good guess, Colin. Yeah, yeah. This uh, was a early, uh, I believe it was actually 1960 proper. This was Tiros. This was the first, uh, some Telstar, some similar thoughts. This was the first weather satellite, uh, Tiros. And the, um, you may have also seen while we were, while we were looking at it, obviously the, the tracks are all very, uh, very spacey in nature. Comet's tail, planetary stroll, Mercurian surf stomp, uh, and that maybe gives you a tip off. Uh, the music itself is uh, very clearly, uh, very clear surf rock, uh, instrumental, uh, real jangly guitars, um, fun little cartoon representation of the guys in the band on the inside with kind of a mission control look and then a, a, a rocket launch tower on the backside. Uh, this was, so this is a, a Swedish band. The record was put out on CD, I think in 2008. And then uh, a small Spanish label called Topaz uh, put out a limited vinyl pressing, uh, 300 copies. Uh, Steve, absolutely, a la Dick Dale Guitars. This is uh, exactly the kind of music you're going to, uh, you will find uh, on this particular record. 
And the uh, you can actually still get copies of the LP, even though there are only 300 copies um, made available. And it is uh, a lot of fun to listen to. So we'll give you some links. The first link there, to <clears throat> Topaz Hit Label, that's the label in Spain. So if you order from them, you'll get prices in Euro, which are a little bit cheaper, but your shipping will be more. Uh, high Tide Shop, that's a, a US shop that, that carry, that actually High Tide is a label that spe specializes in uh, surf music. And so there's lots of, lots of cool stuff in their shop as well. And then the link at the bottom is the, the band's website, but it's a, a very old, uh, dead, looks like it hasn't been updated in, in several years. Um, but that is there as well. And then, oh, did he leave? Sorry, I'm just checking the list. Man, I was hoping Ian McLennan would stick around for a little bit longer for our last record of the week. Uh, last week, Michael said something about geodesium being the earliest planetary music. It, it goes back quite a bit further than that. Uh, the record we're going to talk about uh, today, which is not even the oldest, is a recording of The Last Question, the original Planetarium Show soundtrack. So The Last Question, as many of you probably know, is an Isaac Asimov short story. In the late 1960s, Vondel Chamberlain from the Abrams Planetarium in Michigan uh, went about creating a Planetarium Show version of the story. Uh, the short story deals with entropy and the inevitable end of the universe and it in kind of a, a time traveling fashion. So the planetarium show was narrated by Leonard Nimoy, which is pretty awesome. And then uh, a couple years later, the Strasbourg Planetarium in Rochester, uh, New York, uh, under who was being headed up by Ian at that time, uh, uh, reached out about making a uh, making a version for their uh, for their theater. And what they had in play was this guy down here in the corner, Tim Clark. Starting in 1972, Strasenberg had what we pretty sure was the first uh, musician in residence or composer in residence at a planetarium. And using uh, Moog synths, Tim produced the soundtracks for the shows at Strasenberg, and he created this the musical soundtrack for this adaptation of The Last Question. So this, uh, this particular, I think the record, I think it was released in 72 or 73. I wasn't able to pin down exactly which year. Uh, copies of this pop up online, rare occasion. Uh, it's not something you'll find too often, but if you are curious of how it all, uh, how it played out, I actually found a YouTube video uploaded by John French, currently of the Abrams Planetarium, that actually pairs the Nimoy narration with the, uh, with the soundtrack. So you can actually get a, a little bit of a feel for how it might have looked uh, and sounded. <clears throat> so that's uh, early 70s Planetarium Show soundtrack, The Last Question, will be our last one for the day. And let's share the screen here. All right, so again, our, our list for the day, uh, Jeff Tweedy, Warm Warmer, uh, for your acoustic uh, guy with a guitar, melancholy, Americana-esque uh, feels. The Surfeats, Escapades in Space, for your upbeat, fun, surf, beachfront music. And then finally, the last question, uh, the soundtrack by Tim Clark from Strasenberg for the sort of Strasenberg abrams joint production back in the well, Abrams actually opened it in the late 60s, and then the Strasbourg version was in the early 70s. So that's what we've got. Uh, give, the, uh, give the chat a look here if you have any questions. Otherwise, thanks. And I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in two weeks for the final edition of the Record Shop. All right. Well, thank you, Mike, as always. Uh, and uh, so just to let everybody know, it is three weeks. Um, I even looked at it because it's the end of the month. It's literally 21 days from now. Um, so we've come up to the upcoming events portion. This is where, but, 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 there he is. Uh, I'll turn it over briefly to Mark Webb uh, to discuss a few of the upcoming hospitality suites, uh, except I get to talk about the first one, which is next Monday. Um, so there is going to be a, a, a hospitality suite uh, that we are calling Training for IPS. And so because of the different days that IPS is going to be run on and the different time zones that the presentations are going to be based from, uh, we are having an earlier version of the hospitality suite. And so we are starting 
Uh, I'm going to pull this up right now so that I can absolutely remember it. I uh, believe we're starting at 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so that's going to be 7 p.m. Uh, Universal. And you can just sort of work from there. But that way we're going to try to get a lot of our European and uh, uh, similar you know, Europe and Africa, uh, maybe even as we start getting into um, uh, uh, Western Asia, uh, try to get as many people as possible to come on out. Uh, let us know what your best parts of the year have been like or what you're looking forward to most with 2020 IPS and bring some drinks along as well. So instead of people drinking at two in the morning, they're going to drink at more reasonable hours. Um, if you are working at 3 p.m. or 2 p.m. or noon on a Monday, um, bring lunch or, you know, a, you know, a spiked Shirley Temple or something. Um, just something that you can, anything bubbly will be good. Uh, and so we're, we're going to hold one for uh, more of the European times. And then we might do... We might do one in the morning. Uh, if you are, if you've seen the IPS schedule, you know that there will be one day where, if you're on the East Coast, uh, things I think are running from two until ten a.m. So, kind of a unique uh, time zone um, shift for us all. So, we may just do <laughs> bring your McMuffins and your coffee and your orange juice uh, and kick off your day with your planetarium friends. So. Um, keep that in mind as we're, we're moving forward. And then Mark's got a couple of shifts in the hospitality suites themselves, because with the nighttime ones, we're going to try to do our best to uh, accommodate some of the upcoming e-conferences, uh, IPS, LIPS, and WAC. So Mark, I'll let you, uh, let you take over for that. Yes. Yeah, so... Um, next week is LIPS. Uh, it's 14th, 15th, and 16th. Um, if you've not attended a LIPS before, um, I really recommend that you uh, jump in on this opportunity. It's free uh, this year, and you don't even have to register. Um, you can just go to the uh, LIPS forum on Facebook and uh, find out where you need to uh, link to. But uh, we will be doing a special LIPS version of the virtual hospitality suite next week on Tuesday instead of Thursday. So that's Tuesday, July 14th at uh, 9 Eastern, 8 Central, blah, blah, blah. Um, then uh, during the week of WAC, which is uh, July 27th through the 28th, we will be doing a WAC themed VHS on Tuesday, July 28th. Um, that will be 8 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Mountain. Um, so, you know, there again, uh, WAC is free this year. Uh, you do have to register for that one, but I, it, essentially you have to give them the shell your name and email address um, as the registration. Um, you know, so it's worth it to uh, go in, check it out, even if you can't stay for all of the sessions, um, just check out a few. And then um, hopefully uh, we'll get some people who are active in the conference into the hospitality suite and um, see some new faces. So uh, those are coming up uh, the week in between them, the uh, week starting July 20th, uh, we will go ahead and do a regular Thursday night um, VHS. And then uh, IPS week, um, Michael and I need to talk about what, how we're gonna work that. Um, I've not really had a chance to look at the IPS schedule yet. So we'll, we'll see what that is all about. So we've got a month for that, so. Yeah, we, we understand that people are gonna be conceivably in front of a, of a computer for eight hours and then how much more they want to spend in I'm, front of I'm just going to bring a sleeping bag down here to my office and um, that should pretty much cover it. So Just always be conferencing. That's, that's the rule. <laughs> that's the ABCs. Yes, always be conferencing. <laughs> okay. Um, so join us next week, uh, Tuesday, not Thursday. Um, we'll see you there. A lot of fun. And yeah, um, we've got some of the 
Uh, thank you, Toshi, for putting the um, the WAC registration link into the chat. Um, I think what, what we're going to do, probably before the end of the night, uh, is put up the registrations for IPS, for LIPS, and for, uh, for WAC. And so it's really, you know, three of the next four weeks, we're going to have three new conferences. Um, the reason we're not having uh, any conferences during the week of the 20th is that is Spitz Institute. Um, so we've got 65 people who are going to be participating there for five days. So it's just, this is now online conference season. And we want to give everybody a chance to focus on those uh, and, 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 you know, see new faces and, and, and hopefully hear some, uh, some new stuff. Um, and we will update all of the VHS dates, Amy, both on the Facebook page and on the, the external site. Yeah, um, get them up there today. So we're going to, well, and we'll, we're, we'll get the word out too. We may, um, we may get a couple of these VHSs out to like even further from Dome Dialogue. So we'll see how many people we can get to, to come out. Uh, but of course it is Friday. Uh, and since we've covered all of our bases, it's time for uh, best parts of the week. So if you do have a best part of the week or the last two weeks for that matter, please feel free to share here at the end of our 23rd e-conference. Uh, so we'll just kind of open the floor to everyone. If you've got a best part, go on ahead and share. I saw the comment. I finally saw the comment. <laughs> Everybody really was... Everybody was photographing it, but it, it's, we talked about this last night at hospitality. It's something different when you see it for yourself. Mm -hmm. It's pretty awesome. So, yay. Marco, go ahead. Yeah, it, it's kind of weird right now, this moment. Uh, I have here our president in another screen uh, telling us we're going to have a lockdown for the next nine days, a very heavy, heavy lockdown, barely able to leave the house. Uh, so it's they're, they're like coordinating, but I, I mean, it's for most of the country. Yeah, it's kind of, oof. it's not the best part of the week, but it's what's coming next. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, besides that, I made another funny um, promotional for our virtual reality lenses that I want to show you. I, I put some subtitles as usual. Um, this is not going to be the final uh, version that I can publish in our website or in Facebook because uh, copyright for the music that I wanted to use, there is going to be another uh, version that I, that I can publish, but you can see my <laughs> my original one. So yeah, let me share the screen. Yeah, you're all set, so share away. Okay, there it goes. Sabina, ¿dónde está Luciana? Luciana anda en la luna. Yo sé que siempre anda en la luna, pero dígale que venga. There you go. See, now, now we can't wait what a week of lockdown is going to do to you creatively. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> you can bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, once we get to, uh, once we get to the, the last, um, you know, we've got our final-ish conference in three weeks. Uh, all bets are off. Anybody who wants to participate, anybody who wants to show something, we're going to have the best of our segments and special guests and everything else. So. Marco, if you want to blow us all away in three weeks, there is 10 minutes with your name on it already. Okay. We're, we're, I'll do this. You're yeah. going out on top. You're going out on top. Um, <laughs> any, any other best parts this week? Colin. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, two weeks ago, I did my very first webinar uh, with New York Museum, New Jersey. So it's first, it was the first time I've done anything online like that. Um, talking about the SpaceX launch, so a big thanks to you and Anna for all the info you gave us. 
uh, for the lunch. Um, but yesterday I had one of those, this is why I love my job moments, uh, link up. I've been working with the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire music students. I got their writing music for some of my shows and I got the final soundtrack for a show I'd written about spaceports that was, we launched just before lockdown with a temporary soundtrack. Uh, so we ran that for about three weeks, um, but got the final, the final cut yesterday. So all I need now is an audience, but it, it's, it sounds awesome. It's just brought the whole thing together. So yeah, that was, it was a good way to end a week. Amy, did I see you earlier? Okay, go ahead. So I will miss the virtual hospitality suite on Monday because my daughter is finally graduating high school. They are doing an outdoor graduation ceremony. Well, actually they're doing six outdoor graduation ceremonies next week and hers is scheduled for Monday afternoon. Yay, she'll feel like she finally graduates. Awesome, well, that, that's a big deal. <laughs> All right, any other best parts? Oh. Mr. Smale. Uh, in about two hours, I'm going to get a haircut for the first time since January. <laughs> uh, that's pretty great. I think that might be Sarah's best part of the week, too. Uh, is it just going to be the haircut, or is it going to be a full? Yeah, yeah, just just, just, the, gotcha. just the head of hair. Keep it, keep it great. Awesome. <laughs> Adam, go ahead. Uh, hi, I posted a picture on the chat and yeah, he, my smells like, what the hell is that? <clears throat> this was our very first uh, tryout with um, a, a, a motion capture kit. So you can see the gloves and the straps on my legs and arms and there's the headband and of course they got the mask. Uh, this is for production for a show that literally has been in production in the background since 2009 for a planetarium show. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we're really trying to just get it finished. Um, it's our most ambitious effort ever. And so there's some, there's characters in it that we need to animate. And this was the, probably the most efficient way for us to do so. Um, and so yeah, it's got 32 sensors. So it does fingers, the legs, arms, head. And even if you had like a thing that you're holding, it'll do that. Mm -hmm. And um, the first try was a first try. I'll put it that way. It, uh, <clears throat> it, it worked, but there is uh, a lot of calibration that you need to do in order for it to actually work correctly. And um, like I was, walking across the floor, but my avatar and the system that was gathering the data wasn't traversing across the floor. And that's a common problem, it seems, with these types of kits. So um, we'll see, but hopefully we'll get it so that it makes it a lot easier for our, our artists to finish this job. Anyway, that was our first thing. That was about a week ago. Excellent. Very cool. Any other best parts? Well, I know for, for me and Amy, at least, our weekend is going to get all wet because there's a tropical storm that's heading for the Northeast right now. Like, it's just, it's it's one of those years, you know, I'll tell you. Um, what's next? Who knows? We don't want to know. Um, <laughs> we, we, we see Mike in three weeks and he's just, it's shaved bald. Like, if 2020 went that bad. Um, so... Any other any other uh, best parts before we adjourn for today? Oh, Noreen, yeah, it's it's coming for all of us. It's like That's right up the coast. Just oh, take out all of the mid Atlantic and New England. Um, Do you want to see the blue peacock color that I painted the wall? Why not? Oh, let me turn off this. Ah. Your background on. <laughs> so it all came by because my husband had to put was going to put this huge screen in this wall and I'm like I it was a beige wall that I never liked so that's the color up there oh. so it's not it's not gonna be 
so shocking for the giant screen. And then it has something else. All right, well, that uh, I think brings our 2030 conference to an end, which means that we will see hopefully all of you in three weeks for the grand finale. Uh, but more importantly, it will not be goodbye. It will just be until next time. Um, so get excited. It's going to be fun and uh, probably be seeing a lot of you at LIPS and at WAC and at, and at IPS. Uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but until then, everybody stay safe, stay dry, I guess, if you're, in, you're here in New England. Um, and Mike, good luck on that haircut, sir. So until the 31st, take care, everybody. We'll, uh, we'll see you around. Everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.